Chronicles. We uh, told you last week that originally it's one document, Chronicles, and we'll say a little more about that in a moment. But I want to I want to read if you'll find in your Bibles, please, Second uh, Chronicles seven fourteen. You know this, many of you by heart. This is a it's a verse that pops up from time to time. Uh, not always used in the context in which it was uh, expressed, but Second Chronicles seven fourteen and Second Chronicles sixteen nine. These are the verses we're going to read to introduce the book to you tonight. Well, you'll see them again when we come over the key verses. Stand with me if you would. If you don't have a Bible with you, we've got the text on the screen for you. Second Chronicles seven fourteen says, "If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray, and seek my face." And turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and heal their land. This is uh, this is a, really a commentary on just how the people had turned away from from God, the worship of the true God. In Second Chronicles sixteen nine, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward Him. You've done foolishly in this. For from now on, you will have wars. So you're going to see again, if you're, if you're reading through these books as we get ready to teach through them, you're going to see this theme. Obedience. God, God honors obedience with blessing. He responds to disobedience with, with judgment, with consequences always. Sometimes it's direct on his part. Sometimes he, he, just, he allows things to unfold. So we've just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. Let's... Let's see the breadth of this book as we do a summary of it tonight and see Jesus in it and understand where it fits uh, in the scheme of biblical revelation. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, Second Chronicles uh, parallels. Remember now, we looked at First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. We told you First Chronicles is not a strict retelling of the same things in those previous documents, historical documents, any more than Second Chronicles is. It's more of a spiritual, spiritual teaching. And uh, it parallels First and Second Kings. With its exception, it ignores the northern kingdom. And we told you last week the reason for that is it's focusing on the, on the Davidic line, Davidic line uh, and the spiritual perspective of how the promise of God is fulfilled uh, as that line finally unfolds in Jesus Christ. The northern kingdom of Israel, remember, uh, went just headlong into false worship uh, and then refused to acknowledge the temple in Jerusalem. We looked at that historically. They built, a, built their own temple in Shiloh. And, um, and, so, and, and the temple in Jerusalem is a key fixture uh, around which Second Chronicles is written. Second Chronicles focuses on the kings who pattern their life and reign after that of King David. King David, a man after God's own heart. We told you last week, First Chronicles tells us the good things about David's life. It doesn't go into those disappointed episodes of the flaws that manifest themselves in David because it's about God keeping his promise uh, through, through the line of David. Uh, it gives extended treatment to the, a group of reformers, reformer kings we'll call them, and you'll see their names listed in a few minutes, but uh, Asa and Jehoshaphat and Joash and Hezekiah and Josiah. Uh, the temple and temple worship are central throughout the book uh, because the worship of God, the true and living God, and the avoiding, the abandoning of, of, of idol worship and, and trying to mix together the syncretism of, of mixing uh, the worship of God with the worship of other gods. God, would, he forbids that. You shall have no other gods before me. And, uh, and so there's a big emphasis on that. It's, it's the true worship of the true God is essential for survival of, of them. And by the way, it's, it's essential for survival of any culture, really, where there are people that belong to the Lord. Uh, the book begins with Solomon's, uh, the glory of Solomon's temple. And then it concludes, interestingly enough, and this is where you see, with, with Cyrus' edict to allow the Jews to return home to, to rebuild the temple more than 400 years later. So it begins with this glorious temple. It ends with a, uh, an edict letting the Jews go back from captivity to rebuild the temple. That has some power, symbolism, significance, and we'll see that 
as we study this. Michelle, would you show us uh, the Chronicles video from the Bible Project? The books of First and Second Chronicles. While they're two separate books in our Bibles, that division is not original. Due to scroll length, the book was divided in two, but it was written as one book with one coherent storyline. Now, in our English Bibles, Chronicles comes after the books of Samuel and Kings, and most of Chronicles is actually repeat content from those books. And so most modern readers, when they come to Chronicles, they think, wait a minute, I just read all of this, and so they skip it. And that's a shame, because this book is really unique and important important in the Bible. In the traditional Jewish ordering of the Bible, Chronicles is actually the last book because it summarizes all of the Jewish scriptures. The first word in the book is Adam, the first character at the beginning of the story, and then the last paragraph announces the return of Israel from exile. Now we don't know who wrote this book, but we can tell from details within it, it was produced by somebody who lived a couple hundred years after the Israelites returned from the Babylonian exile. Now for this author, Jerusalem and the temple were rebuilt some time ago, and as we learned from Ezra and Nehemiah, things were not going well. The great prophetic hope was that the city and the temple would be rebuilt, that God would come to live among his people, the messianic king would come, and all the nations would come live under his peaceful rule, and none of that has happened. And so the author of Chronicles has reshaped these stories of David and Solomon and the kings of the past in order to provide a message of hope for the future. And we'll see that he's designed this book to emphasize two clear themes. First, the hope of the coming messianic king, and second, the hope for a new temple. Let's just dive in and you'll see these themes all over the book. First Chronicles begins with nine chapters of genealogies, long lists of names. And you'll read these and think that this is kind of boring, and that may be true for you, but actually they're very, very important. The author is summarizing here the whole storyline of the Old Testament by naming all of the key characters in the stories. And as he does so, he shapes the genealogies to emphasize two key lineages. First is the line of the promised messianic king. So lots of space is dedicated to tracing the line of Judah that led all the way to King David, to whom the messianic promise was given. And then from David, the author traces that line up into his own day. The other family line that receives lots of attention here is that of the priesthood, the descendants of Aaron, who of course served in the temple. And so right from the start, you can see the two main themes, the author's hope of the Messiah coming to build a new temple, and it's rooted in these ancient genealogies. Now after that, the author moves into the stories about David, and most of these are going to be familiar to you from the book of Samuel, but again, there's some really important differences. So first of all, the author leaves out all of the negative stories about David where he's portrayed as weak or immoral. So Saul chasing David around the desert and persecuting him, the story of David's adultery, Bathsheba, and then murdering her husband, all of that is gone. And what's left are the stories that portray David as a good guy. And not only that, there's also new additional material that you won't find in the book of Samuel that shows David in a very positive light. So there's a large block of chapters where David makes preparations for the temple. He arranges resources and builders and Levites and choirs. And not only that, the author also portrays David as a Moses-like figure. God gives David plans for building the temple just as he gave plans to Moses for building the tabernacle. So why all this new material about David? The author's not trying to hide David's flaws. He knows that anybody can go read about them in the book of Samuel. Rather, he's trying to portray David as the ideal king in order to make him an image or a type of the future Messiah from the line of David. It's very similar to how Jeremiah or Ezekiel spoke of the coming Messiah as a new David. This is most clear in how the author retells the story of God's covenant promise to David in 1 Chronicles 17. When you compare this story with its parallel in 2 Samuel 7, you'll see that the author of Chronicles is highlighting that neither David nor Solomon nor any of the kings from his line were the messianic king, and that when the Messiah does come, he will be a king like David. And so for this author, these stories about David from the past are what sustain his hope for the future. 
After David dies, we move into 2 Chronicles, which focuses on the kings that lived in Jerusalem. And again, there's lots of overlap with 1 and 2 Kings, but there are many key differences. So the author has left out all of the stories about the kings of northern Israel so he can just focus on the line of David. And there's lots of new material about these kings from David's line. He highlights the kings that were obedient to God, and he adds new stories about how their obedience led to success and God's blessing. But he also adds new stories about kings who were unfaithful to God. They didn't follow the Torah, they led Israel to worship idols, and these kings face horrible consequences all leading up to Israel's exile, a mess of their own making. And so this whole section becomes a series of character studies where the author wants later generations of Israelites to learn from their family history and so become faithful to their God and the Torah. Now the book's conclusion is really unique too. At the very end of the book, the king of the Persians is named Cyrus, and he tells the Israelites that they can go back home, return from exile, rebuild the city and the temple. And he says, last line of the book, whoever there is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. And that's how the book ends with an incomplete sentence. Now, of course, the author knows about the first return from exile and the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah, but clearly in his view, the prophetic hopes of Israel were not fulfilled in those events. And so this incomplete ending shows that the author's hope is set on yet another return from exile, when the Messiah will finally come to rebuild the temple and restore God's people. And so the book of Chronicles, it's the final book of the Jewish scriptures, it ends by pointing forward. It calls God's people to look back in order to look ahead because the past has become the source of hope for the future. So Chronicles concludes the Old Testament as a story in search of an ending, and that's what this book is all about. Okay, and so that's going to be picked up further. Uh, we told you last week about authorship that perhaps, perhaps Ezra uh, is the author there's, we're not absolutely sure about that. So let's look at a survey now, Second Chronicles, just real quickly. Um, it's a continuation of this spiritual commentary uh, on, on Israel during the kingdom period, particularly the southern kingdom of Judah. Um, ignores the northern kingdom because of false worship. It does focus in on, I want to I highlight real quickly, just, just show you the names and kind of the sections. The reformer kings. Uh, Asa is uh, highlighted in chapter 14 and 15, Jehoshaphat in 17 to 20, Joash in, in 23, 16 to 24, 16, Hezekiah in chapters 29 to 32, and then Josiah 34 to 35, where there is a revival that takes place because they, just, they rediscover the book of the law. And it's a, quite, a, quite a moving uh, read as you get toward the end of Second Chronicles. The, when we think about how it's broken down, it's broken into two major sections. The first section is, has to do with the reign of Solomon, and that's uh, chapter 1, 1 through chapters, chapter 9, verse 31. This takes place in Judah. It's over a period of about 40 years. It has to do, when you read through that, it touches on the inauguration of Solomon, the, the completion of the temple, uh, the glory of Solomon's reign. We told you that early on it was, just, it was, it was really the apex of, of the, the role of king, the king of God. Then the splendor of the temple being constructed. And so you have that. Uh, it's, a, it's a golden age of peace and prosperity, uh, worship in the temple. Um, kingdom is still united. And the boundaries are extending to the greatest point. Uh, Solomon's wealth and wisdom, uh, the palace and the temple are legendary. You still hear people refer to today the wisdom of Solomon. Uh, he shows an incredible uh, power spiritually, politically. Uh, the architectural feats uh, place Israel really above uh, physically, uh, visually above the other nations. Uh, and six of the nine chapters in this chapter one through nine, six of the nine chapters address the construction and dedication of the temple. So it shows you the, the focus of the temple uh, because it shows you the focus of the worship of Yahweh. The, the second portion of the book has to do with the reign of the kings of Judah, verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 1 through chapter 36, verse 23. This spans 393 years, okay? And of 
course, it deals with the division of the kingdoms into the northern and southern kingdom, the reforms that take place under, the, under uh, Asa and Jehoshaphat and Joash, Hezekiah, and Josiah. That uh, spans 14, uh, 1 to 35, 27 uh, intermittently. The fall of, of Judah uh, in chapter 36. And then the disaster of the temple being destroyed. So notice how you move in Second Chronicles from the glory of the temple being built to the disaster of the temple being destroyed. Destroyed, and so you you have this um, the the is the glory of Israel that you see in the first part of of Second Chronicles is short lived. After Solomon dies, the nation is divided. Uh, both northern and southern kingdom begin a downward spiral uh, that is that is halted occasionally by religious reforms. Uh, I remind you, the northern kingdom was taken captive by Assyria in 722. Uh, BC 586 BC is when the southern uh, kingdom uh, Judah is taken and so you see the difference how much longer uh, Judah lasted than uh, than Israel the northern kingdom they forsake temple worship they forsake the worship of Yahweh exclusively and war and unrest is, is what is fomented there's, some, there's reformation in these men that I cited. They make some, some valiant reformation attempts, uh, but they, they never last beyond one generation, and so they slide back into their ways. One writer observed this. I thought this was interesting. That About 70% of chapters 10 to 36 deal with eight good kings and leaves only 30% to cover the 12 uh, evil kings. Each king is, is observed, as, the, as our video said, in the terms of these character studies uh, in respect to his relationship to the temple as the center of worship and, and his own as spiritual strength. And when the king serves Yahweh, Judah's blessed with political and economic prosperity. Let's just look real quickly. I want to give you just a brief sketch of these kings uh, in Judah, the southern kingdom. First of all, you have Rehoboam. Uh, he, I've, got, I've put this up. He's not righteous but he does uh, experience a humbling before God and manages to, to head off the wrath of God. Abijah uh, enjoys a short uh, but evil reign. Uh, and he conquers Israel because, quote, the children of Judah relied on the Lord God. So you have this, this mix that, that, when, that when he leads a people who have a sense of reliance, God even blesses that in the midst of evil leadership. Then third is Asa. Uh, he destroys the foreign altars and idols. He conquers Ethiopia uh, against incredible odds uh, through his trust in God, and he restores the altar of the Lord. But he fails to trust God when threatened by Israel. So, they, so you see these men, they're, they're, they're not glossed over, uh, no sugarcoating here. You see them in their high moments, but you also see how they come up short. Fourth is Jehoshaphat. Uh, brings a great revival. Uh, his heart... Uh, took delight in the ways of the Lord, uh, chapter 17, verse 6 says. Uh, he overthrows idols, teaches God's word to the people, trusts in God for battle, but again, he moves off the scene. And Jehoram uh, follows him, a wicked king. He goes after the ways of Ahab. He marries Ahab's daughter, uh, leads Judah into idolatry, and dies uh, in pain. And, and here's the commentary on him. He departs. With no one's sorrow. No one, is, no one is sorrowful to see him leave. Then you have in chapter 6 and 7 Ahaziah and Adaliah. Ahaziah is as wicked as his father and as, as is his mother Adaliah. Both end up being murdered. And there's Joash. Uh, Joash leads in the repair of the temple, restores the worship to the true God. Uh, Jehoiada, the priest, dies. Joash allows the people to abandon the temple and return to idolatry. So you see here a man who, who had the makings of, of good leadership, but when he loses spiritual uh, influence in, in uh, Jehoiada, then he gives in to the people. Amaziah, uh, it's a mixed bag in terms of his relationship. Uh, he forsakes the Lord for the gods of Edom and is defeated by Israel and later murdered. I mean, you just see this over and over, this, this recurring tragedy after tragedy. Uzziah. Uzziah begins well with the Lord and is blessed with military victories. Uh, Uzziah, by the way, was a, was a boyhood friend of, of Isaiah. Um, 
However, when he becomes strong, he proudly and presumptuously plays the role of a priest by offering incense in the temple and therefore struck with leprosy. And so he comes to a, to a tragic end when he steps out of his role as king and begins to assume the role of priest. Looking forward, there's only one who will come who can be both priest and king, and he's prophet as well, and that's the, that's the Messiah. So for anyone to try to cross over in that is really an assault upon God's uh, word and God's, God's plan, his will. <clears throat> Jotham. Uh, Jotham rebuilds the gate of the temple and, and reveres God, and the Lord blesses him with prosperity and victory. Then you have Ahaz, um, the very name you associate Ahaz with, with wickedness. He was an idolater. Uh, it's oppressed by his enemies, forced to give tribute to the Assyrians from the treasury of the temple. Hezekiah <clears throat> repairs and reopens the temple and puts away the altars and idols set up by his father Ahaz. Judah is spared destruction by Assyria because of his righteousness. The Lord honors his leadership in, in bringing back worship of the true God in the temple without, without idol influence. His reforms are given only a few verses in Kings, but three chapters in Chronicles. And that that kind of gives you, that's, that's a little snapshot of how different these historical writings are. Kings references them. Chronicles uh, emphasizes uh, this good work in restoring the worship of the true God to the temple. Manasseh and, and Ammon. Uh, Manasseh is Judah's most wicked king. He sets up idols and altars all over the land. Uh, he repents when he's carried away by Assyria. God brings him back to Judah, and he makes a halfway reform, but it's, it's too late. Ammon follows in his father's wickedness, and both kings end up being murdered. Josiah. A leader in reforms and spiritual revival, he centers worship around the temple, finds the law, obeys it, it reinstitutes the Passover. It's the reading of the law that's very gripping to the people. Uh, how could we have gotten so far away from, from our God as they discover his rule and his word in the law? Then uh, 17 to 19, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, and Jehoiachin. Uh, just unrelenting evil, which leads to the downfall of Judah. The temple is ravaged uh, under each of their reigns. And then you have uh, Zedekiah, the last king, is also wicked. Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed, and the captivity begins. But it ends on a note of hope. And this was referenced in the video you just saw. Because at the end of the captivity, Cyrus of Persia issues this decree for the restoration of Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? May the Lord his God be with him, and let him go up uh, to finish, to restore, and to rebuild. So that's, that's kind of a little survey and overview of, of the role of these, of these kings. I hope it kind of helps you uh, get a flavor of them, particularly as you read back through something like this. Well, as far as the, uh, the title of it, we mentioned last week uh, about the title, uh, that it, uh, it's variously called, from, and it's in the Hebrew, the words of the days was the Hebrew uh, title for this, for this one document, the Chronicles, that was broken into two because of, of the available length of the scrolls. Uh, if you wanted to give a modern day, I told you this last week, flair to that, uh, the words of the days would be the events of the times. In other words, how to understand those times spiritually. It's, it's, it's really sort of an Old Testament equivalent to the book of Acts. You know, the, the book of Acts is, is, is the acts of the, of the early church or the acts of the apostles through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit leading, and it gives you a spiritual history of the development of the church. Well, this is a spiritual history of, uh, of Judah and the line of David. Um, author, just another touch on that. Don't know for sure. Uh, Ezra, or a contemporary of Ezra, uh, it is, it's set, if you want to get a flair for the, for the dates and the settings, chapters 1 through 9 cover 40 years, I told you that, but it's from 971 B.C. to 931 B.C., that's the time span. Chapters 10 through 36 cover the 393 years, from 931 B.C. to 538, that's quite a, that's quite a swath to cover. Um, plus, it begins with Adam. It's really a, this is why it's the last book in the Hebrew Old Testament. It is a, it's a panorama 
of the moving of God to continue to fulfill his promise uh, made, uh, made to Adam and Eve that the seed of the, uh, of the woman would crush the head of the seed of the serpent. His promise made to Abraham that, that the, your descendants will be as the, as the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea. And, and so you get this sweeping look at history, God's story. Uh, and so it really, in that sense, covers uh, more of a span of time than any other book in the Bible. I've mentioned this. Uh, I think I've got that up on the slide there. You have this uh, prediction of this 70-year captivity in, in Babylon uh, that Jeremiah makes, and it's fulfilled in two ways. First, a political captivity in which Jerusalem is overcome from 605 to 536. And then second, a religious captivity involving the destruction of the temple in 586 and uh, the completion of the new temple in 516 or 515 when they return from captivity. And so there's the, there's the prophecy and the fulfillment of it. As far as what is the theme uh, and the purpose of Second Chronicles, some of this we've gone over before because we're, we're trying to deal in, with two books in our Bible that are one, one book in the, in the Hebrew Old Testament. It provides a topical history, <clears throat> beginning with the end of the United Kingdom uh, and the Kingdom of, of Judah. Uh, one writer said this about it. I thought this was, it's a divine editorial on the spiritual characteristics of the Davidic dynasty. So it focuses on the southern uh, rather than uh, the northern kingdom uh, because they're the ones... They're the line from which David and his line would issue. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, uh, they're the ones who come back to Yahweh. This never happens in the northern kingdom once they begin to go astray. Uh, when you read through Chronicles, Second Chronicles, only what's done in accordance with God's will had any lasting value. It's kind of what we talked about this morning, uh, looking from the 1 Corinthians 3 perspective. What are we building? Only that which they did in accordance with God's will uh, had any lasting value. And that's what God used, by the way, to continue to issue forth uh, the line of David. It concentrates, as I've told you, on the kings who were, who were reforming and, and attempting to bring the people back to the worship, true worship of the one true God in his uh, house called by his name in the temple. Uh, but, but it was not enough. It was not enough. And when I gave you that sketch of the kings a while ago, you saw where just after Josiah, it just picks up with, with rapid speed and they plunge headlong into captivity. The temple in Jerusalem, by the way, is a, is a unifying theme. Now, it all centers around the temple. David had wanted to build a temple. God said, I haven't asked you to do that. He let David get in on it by, by making preparations for it. But it's God's house, not a house that somebody would make for God. It's God's house. Now, for the Jews, you know, we, we're, not, we're not there today because of our influence by Jesus Christ, and we're going to see this in a few minutes. But for the Jews, just as in the tabernacle, when you go back to the wilderness wanderings, and the Shekinah glory would descend upon the tabernacle to the tent of meeting, it meant for them that God was present among them and he was summoning them to a meeting, summoning the leaders at least to come and meet before him and go tell the people what he had to say. In the temple, they weren't watching for the, for the descending of the Shekinah because they believed in the building of the temple that the Shekinah dwelt there. Remember Isaiah 6? Isaiah says in the year that King Uzziah died, Uzziah was a, was a friend of Isaiah's. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. They believed that, that in the temple uh, you would meet God in the fullness of his being to the extent that you could. No one has seen me and lived, he told Moses. But to the extent that you could, you would meet God in the fullness of his being in the temple. So when they were taken away, when they were taken into captivity by the Babylonians, uh, I've cited this before for you on the Psalms, you know, on the willows there, where? In captivity. We hung up our harps. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? What are they talking about there? 
Doesn't sound very missionary to me. There are missionaries go all over the Because in their mind, when you're taken away from the house of God, the temple, you're taken away from God. God has, God has let you be carried away. He has basically abandoned you. He's turned his back on you. And you, and you cannot worship the true and living God in the mindset of the, of the Jews of these, uh, of these centuries we're studying here, apart from his house. That's how critical the temple was to them. It was the, it was the rallying point. It was the reminder, God is with this people. As long as God is with this people, no enemy can successfully come against us. Nothing formed against you will prosper, would be the promise, as long as God is with his people. And so for them to be taken away from that, to, to experience the destruction of it, where it's, it's raised, it's just leveled to the ground, is a devastating blow. It, it, is, the, it is the gasp in their minds the last gasp of the hope that God would be all he had promised to be to these people. And so the, so the temple plays a very critical role and a unifying role. If you, if you read through Second Chronicles with these lenses, every time a king is raised up who restores worship to the temple, who clears the temple of these idols and comes back to the worship of the true and living God according to the dictates that he prescribed in his word, the people are blessed, they experience a season of, of God's goodness. But the minute they begin to turn their back on that, and God withdraws the hand of his blessing. And that's how they viewed the movement of God among them. Uh, it symbolically stood for his presence among his people and the high calling he had called them to. One writer said this who, who was convinced that Ezra is the author. He's more convinced than I am, I'll, I'll, but I'll read this. Ezra wrote this book to encourage the people to accept the new temple raised, R-A-I-S-E-D, on the site of the old and remind them of their true calling and God's faithfulness in spite of their low circumstances. And he goes on to say that the Davidic line, the temple, the priesthood were still theirs. And so if you, if you can... Imagine Ezra writing, looking back on this portion of their history, and he tells the story of the construction of the temple, Solomon's reign, the division, the kings of Judah, the highs and lows, then the really low, telling it all the way to the edict that Cyrus of Persia issues to go back, those who belong to him go back, and rebuild. But the picture there is God is not through with his people. That's the, that's the message that you get when you read all the way through Second Chronicles and you look back at, what, at the storyline that it tells. The Davidic line, the temple, and the priesthood were still theirs. And that is, that's highlighted in the rebuilding of the temple. Well, what about the keys to Second Chronicles? Well, um, the key word, the key phrase would be a, a priestly view of Judah because it has to do with, with temple worship and with God raising up some, some reforming kings who would, who would guard that, who would re return that. But it also has to do with the implications of, of abandoning. So this priestly view of, of, of Judah. Then I read to you the, the key verses. We read those to begin. Again, if my people who are called by my name, look, look with me if you would at Second Chronicles. I want you to put this in context because, like I said, this is, this is ripped out of context from time to time by folks. It may be wrongfully applied uh, to America as a nation, not necessarily the spiritual people in America, but to America as a nation. Listen, after, uh, after the dedication of the temple, look in verse 11. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord, and the king's house, all that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord, and in his own house he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Okay? Look what God tells him. He's going to do what's coming. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, 
or send pestilence among my people. Why would he say that? Why would he say that? Because of what's coming in terms of the line of kings. When they will be raised up and they will lead the people of God. In other words, you, the fact that you've built a temple, you, you haven't somehow caught God and put him in a box. I have agreed that this will be a house where sacrifice will be made for me, he says. But he's telling Solomon something that should be repeated to the generations following. When I do these things, I shut up the heavens, there's no rain. I command the locusts to devour the land. I send pestilence among my people. This is in their history. This is their story, how they were brought out of Egypt with these very powerful judgmental acts of God. And now he's talking about directing this toward those who name his name. When this happens, verse 14, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves. Why would he do that? Because they become a proud people. They're, they think that they've got God in a box, that they've got God on their side, no matter what, will humble themselves and pray. Seek my face. Not, not, not go through the motions of prayer. I've reminded you before that uh, J.C. Ryle's excellent book, A Call to Holiness, or Holiness, is, is accompanied by a smaller book, A Call to Holiness, and one of them is A Call to Prayer. And he, he asks him that. He says, I want to ask you, do you pray? I didn't ask you, do you say your prayers? I want to ask you, do you pray? And this is, this is the picture. Humble themselves and pray and seek my face. That's the nature of the prayer. Not going through the motions of prayer, the, the prayers they were taught to pray at certain times, at certain festivities and certain occasions in the temple, but seeking the face of God. Oh, God, show your face to us. Remember? When, when God withdraws. In the, in the mind of the Hebrew, he has turned his back on his people. His countenance is no more friendly toward his people. Should remind us that when our Savior was on the cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you turned away from me? And we know why, because he became sin who knew no sin. Listen to what God says. Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. So the cry of God of, of, of repentance is matched by evidentiary repentance. What John the Baptist said, bring forth fruit that evidences repentance. Don't just mouth it. We're sorry, God. I work with my, uh, work with my children when they were growing up, and now with my grandchildren. All right, now, tell your mother or your grandmother or your sibling you're sorry. Sorry. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> You mouthed the word, sorry. You did not express sorrow. And you go through this with them enough, and you pray God sets that on fire one day, and then, and then they understand the, the, that verbal repenting, seek my face, is attended by, by evidentiary, fruit of, of repentance. And turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. Now here's, God always hears. He, he seeks, he searches to and fro the earth, looking at the one, for the one who, who has a broken spirit and a contrite heart, who trembles at his word. That's how Isaiah closes out his prophecy. But he will hear with a view to answering. He will hear with a view to doing, to responding to their, the, the plea that they're making. And will forgive their sin. And heal their land. Now, keep on reading. My eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And as for you, if you will walk before me as David your father walked, do according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with David your father, saying, You shall not lack a man to rule Israel. But if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I've set before you and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you from my land that I have given you. 
And this house that I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And at this house, which was exalted, everyone passing by will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done this to this land and to this house? Then they will say, because they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this disaster on them. It is, it is a prophetic warning of God. Solomon ignored it. He went into this, these, these uh, suzerainty treaties, marrying 900 relatives of these different uh, potentates around him to, to try to keep peace. And then those who followed, the same thing. So when you hear Second Chronicles 7.14, put it in the context here. It is the promise of God to bless his people there in, uh, in Jerusalem if they follow him. But attending that is the promise to judge and curse if they abandon him. And that's exactly what happened. When you read that and you see the unfolding, you go, oh my goodness, they did not. They did not believe it. They didn't take it in, anything beyond the head. If they, they didn't take it in at the heart for sure. And then, then the other verse, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth. Let's, let's look over here at this real quick. Show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. Look at verse 7 of, of, of six, chapter 16. Put a context here. At that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you relied on the king of Syria and did not rely on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Syria has escaped you. Were not the Ethiopians and the Libyans a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he gave them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run, there's the verse we read. You've done foolishly, and you will have wars. Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in the stocks in prison, for he was in a rage with him because of this. And Asa inflicted cruelties upon some of the people at the same time. The acts of Asa from first to last are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was diseased in his feet, and his disease became severe. Yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but sought help from physicians. And Asa slept with his fathers, dying in the 41st year of his reign. They buried him in the tomb that he had cut for himself in the city of David. They laid him on a bier that had been, fulfilled, been filled with the various kinds of spices prepared by the performer's, performer's art. They made a very great fire in his honor. Even the warning came from God. He would not heed. It hardened him. It hardened him. It just gives you a snapshot. You will, you will be on the receiving end of wars, not the good end, not the victorious end, because you did not look to the Lord, who, who has a history with you of giving you victory over greater odds when you look to him and depend upon him. So those, that kind of comes, those two verses are sort of a synopsis, a snapshot of the entire book. Chapter 34, by the way, is, the, is considered the key chapter. I would encourage you to read that. If you've not read anything else in, in Second Chronicles, read that. It goes through the reforms. Uh, and revivals under, uh, under uh, Jehoshaphat and Joash and Hezekiah and Josiah, uh, particularly that dramatic revival under Josiah when the book of the law is found, read, and obeyed. Well, what about finding, seeing Jesus in Second Chronicles? Well, the throne of, of David has been destroyed, all right? Uh, but the line of David remains, and this is very important for the people. Because remember, these are visual people. When a king's throne is destroyed, it's a, it's a symbol, it's a, it's, a, it's a referendum that he, uh, he's been deposed and his line will not continue. But not so with God. It, it, it challenges the people to think more spiritually and less, less physically of how to understand God's working and God's ways. In the face of murders and treachery and battles and captivity, all of these things threaten the continuation of the messianic line. But it remains, as Second Chronicles captures for us, it remains unbroken from Adam to Zerubbabel. 
And you see when you, when you put those lenses on and you read the genealogies in Matthew 1 and Luke 3, you see how God's line continues unabated. No matter how far afield the people have gone, God, God traces his line. It's what, what some historians call the scarlet, scarlet thread that runs through the Bible. He's always had a people. He's always had a remnant. He always will to accomplish his will and his purpose. The temple uh, is a powerful prefiguring of Christ. The centrality that the temple plays uh, in the life of Judah. And as, as goes the temple, so goes the people. As the worship of the temple is high and holy and fixed upon, upon Yahweh, the people are blessed. When they begin to remove themselves from that, uh, the blessings uh, disappear. It prefigures Christ. Jesus said, look at Matthew 12, 6. He says, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. Of course, he's speaking about himself. Uh, he likened uh, his body to the temple. Look at John 2, 19, and one of the, one of the controversies he had surrounding uh, what was going on in the temple. Uh, it was, that he was blaspheming it, he said. Jesus answered, destroy this temple. In three days I will raise it up. Of course, they, when he says it again, like we looked at toward the end of Mark, they said, Master, this temple was, was built for, for decades. How can you say that? Of course, as he was speaking about his body. He becomes the temple. In Revelation 21, 22, when we get to the end of the book, the end of the story, I saw no temple in the city. Think about that now. With Jewish eyes, that's what you'd be looking for, is, is evidence of the presence of God. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And so we see that, this, that, the, that the massive, ornate, incredibly awesome temple, Solomon's temple, and those that were built after the destruction of Solomon's temple, were a prefiguring of Jesus Christ. So Paul would teach, and we're going to see this in Paul in Corinthians, your body is the temple, the Holy Spirit. How can that be? Because he dwells in us. It's where the Lord dwells. It is, the temple is the dwelling place of God, and Jesus is the fulfillment of that. And so, so you want to be, you want to worship Jesus like, just like with the, with the zeal and all that they worshiped God in the temple in its heyday. You worship Jesus, and you know that he's given us the Holy Spirit so he makes us what we read this morning. We're, we're living stones being built up into a, a, a royal nation, a holy priesthood. These powerful symbols are just, they're woven through these historical stories in the Old Testament. And we see them seized upon by the writers of the New Testament to tell us the spiritual reality that was always there. It was always there. Well, what about its contribution to the Bible? Well, as I said earlier, it begins with Adam. And it ends with the decree of Cyrus in 538 B.C. It touches on more history than any other Old Testament book. It focuses on the period from David to the captivity of Judah and looks at the, at the, at the reigns of 21 kings and one queen. I found this by a writer that I thought was pretty insightful. He said, at, at the time of the, the, the Chronicles was written, it taught lessons from the past, that's there, your character sketches that you learn. Illustrated God's faithfulness in the present, even though they went far afield, God never ultimately abandoned them. When he returns them from captivity for the building of another temple. And it anticipated the fulfillment of God's promises in the future as the messianic line continued to unfold, that they could look forward to one coming from the line of David who would sit on the throne forever. It traces the conception of the temple in David's mind when he said, I want to build a house for you. The construction and consecration of the temple by Solomon. The corruption and cleansing of the temple by the kings of Judah, depending on whether they were evil or whether they were reformers. And then finally, conflagration. As Nebuchadnezzar brings it down to no stone, no two stones left on one another. And destroys it. It's a fascinating spiritual history. If you want to 
You think about it now. Remember, this, this is, if we, were, if we were Jews reading the Hebrew Old Testament, this is the last book. This is the book that summarizes everything else that's in it. The law, the prophets, the, the poetic writings, the Proverbs, the whole Tanakh, as they call it. And this is the last document that summarizes it all so that you're able to see it all through the lenses of God moving through history, fulfilling his promises, not letting anything deter him committed to bring Messiah from the Jewish people and give him as a gift to all those who would trust in him. And that's Second Chronicles. Lord willing, uh, we will tackle uh, next week uh, the book of Ezra.